So I'm going to talk to you today about password storage and uh, attacking. Yeah, it was pointed out that is a spelling mistake. I'm sorry. Um, spelling is definitely not my strong suit. So, so this project, uh, this talk, I'm also basing it around a project that I did um, specifically for this talk called Password Bad Web App. It's a bad web application, meaning it has intentional vulnerabilities and it's designed for use for educational purposes. So you can go out on GitHub right now and check this out and follow along. It doesn't require anything except Apache. Um, it does have a few dependencies that you can um, install, but we're gonna look at it a little bit through here, but I definitely encourage you after the talk to go play around with it. Is Apache necessary? Apache isn't necessary, some web server is. Um, and this is what the basic login page is. It's, think of it like a blog post, uh, like a blog engine. Um, and it has extremely primitive login functionality. And it tells you you've logged in. There's no session management, there's no anything. All it's doing is a quick check on the post. So it's really designed around um, to experiment with password hashing. So moving along, let's start from the very, very, very beginning. What if we use plain text to store our passwords? Obviously, it's storing them in plain text right in the database. Um, in the case of the bad web app, it's using a flat file, a data file, but it's storing them in plain text. What's wrong with that? Can anyone see any problems here? No? No problems? <laughs> what happens if we have an SQL injection vulnerability? So as part of this bad web app, I have a simulated SQL injection vulnerability that simulates select star from users. So I can show you what that looks like here. So we see, I just put a little bit of flare injected here to let you know it's different from the main page. We have our two posts and then we have user one, user two and their plain text password. So this is extremely bad because every single user on your system is immediately exposed to any attacker. Pretty obvious. I hope I don't need to go too deep into that. And if I do, come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> so the problem here is that any attack vector into your system that actually gets into the system, so everything beyond a simple cross-site scripting attack, um, le leaks all user credentials. So we can do better. So if we use MD5, that's the next logical step beyond plain text. Let's just hash this password. It uses the MD5 cryptographic hashing function. What's a hash though? Think of the hash as a fingerprint. If I want to know who you are and I take a picture, I can then go around the room with that picture and look and find that, hey, that's you. Whereas a fingerprint, I need to actually get access to you in order to see if it's the same. And that's the same kind of um, thought process that a cryptographic hash uses in that it's very, very trivial if I have the original to get to this fingerprint. It's very, very, very difficult if I have this fingerprint to get back to the original. Now there are some attack methods that we can use and we'll talk about those in a minute, um, but just from a mathematical perspective, it's very, very, very inefficient to, reserve, uh, to reverse them. But there's also another key that we'll come to later. They should also be very efficient to compute. They should be very easy to take your fingerprint or take the fingerprint of that password. So what's the problem if we have MD5? The SQL injection vulnerability from before still gives us that hash. But since the hash is one way, how can we attack it? The first method and the easiest method is with a lookup table. And you use a lookup table every single day. Google. Paste in an MD5 into Google, and not all the time, but a lot of times you will get back a result. So this hash here, MD5 password. Simple. Lookup tables are incredibly CPU efficient. They're also incredibly storage system inefficient. Um, because you need to have one line with the hash and one line with the password for every single hash that you do. So it's, a, it's very much on the CPU side of a, of a time memory trade-off. So to do all passwords less than or equal to seven characters, it requires about one and a half petabytes of storage. 
I mean, think about, just try to think of that kind of scale. Um, and if you were to try to use these practically, only incredibly simple passwords would fall. So we can do better. Enter the, the uh, famous rainbow table. Now, the way a rainbow table solves this um, problem is by switching that time memory trade-off more in the, fa in the um, to the scope of less memory, but we're going to use the CPU more. So we take a seed. So we start off, let's guess a random password. We run that through our hash function, and now we have a hash. Then we take a reduce function, which is basically a one-way function that takes a hash as an input and produces something that looks like a password as the output. And we run that through hash again. So we have the input, reduce, and that generates a new password, which then we continue on this chain. The rainbow table, we chain a whole bunch of these together. Um, sometimes you could do 100 chain length, you can do 20,000 chain length, you could do a million hashes as your chain length. So when we want to attack a hash, we have a hash. What we first do is look at the end of the table and do we have a match? No. Okay, run it through reduce and check again. No, run it through reduce, run it through reduce again and check again and you keep iteratively checking up to the hash length. So, uh, up, sorry, up to the chain length. So if the chain is a thousand um, operations long, it can take a thousand operations to check to see if a hash is in the rainbow table. So it's very CPU inefficient, but it's very space efficient. Um, it uses much, much, much less storage. That one and a half petabytes drops down to 64 gigabytes. Um, and this lookup takes roughly about a second and a half whereas the lookup in the lookup table takes microseconds. And it's also worth noting that it's probabilistic. So because we're using reduce function, we're not actually iterating every possible password. We design it in such a way that with a reasonable size table, we're going to theoretically hit every password. So that's why we say most passwords instead of all passwords. So how do we defend against a rainbow table? Well, the most common method is add a dose of salt. So salt at MD5, and this is just another branch in Git, um, uses the MD5 cryptographic hash function, but adds a unique salt per user. And that's very, very, very important. Because what we want to do is make an attacker attack every single password individually. The second they can reuse an attack on more than one password, it makes their lives easier. We don't want to make their lives easier. We want to make it harder. So the traditional way, and you'll see this in lots and lots of tutorials, is take the salt and append a password, right? So a couple notes on assault before we get into how we're gonna attack this. It must be unique, preferably globally. Um, you, if you use a strong random function, then you're pretty much safe. Um, but don't use things like a username, don't use an email, don't use something predictable that another site might use. That partially defeats the point of assault. So what is the problem now? If we um, SQL inject, we still get the hash and we also get the salt. But salts defeat rainbow tables. So how can we possibly attack this? Does anyone here see how we can attack this so far? I've given you all the information you need to know to how we're gonna attack this. Anyone? So this was a slide that was up earlier and there's a very key word on this slide and I'm gonna bold it. Hash functions like MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256, SHA-512 are designed, and one of their design philosophies is that they're efficient. They're fast. They can process large amounts of data. Some are more efficient than others, uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. So since they're made to be fast, brute forcing becomes a real, real viable alternative. Um, there's a several tools that are open and freely available. Hashcat is one, and John the Ripper is another, and they both use different techniques, um, and they can use GPUs to accelerate the attacks, and they're very, very, very intelligent about how they attack passwords, and they're a lot quicker than you would expect. So there's a couple different ways we can brute force. We can do a mask-based brute force. What that means is I define, let's say I want to attack a six-character password. I can say the first character is lowercase, the second character is lowercase, the third character is uppercase, and so on. 
and it'll loop through all possible permutations of that mask and try each one, one after another. So that's a traditional brute force. We can do dictionary-based, where we take an English language or an international language dictionary and run it through and try every single possible one of them. We can do combinations. So um, a combinator-based attack would be um, correct horse battery staple, to use the XKCD reference. Um, they're actually very efficient at attack attacking those. You can use fingerprint-based, which takes the result of a combinator and um, combines it with additional permutations. So correct horse battery staple three, correct horse battery staple four, and then rule-based, which think of it like a transformation. Um, if we wanted to attack a dictionary and do the leet speak replaces, so instead of an A, put an at, you can define a rule that anytime you see an A in a candidate password, fork that candidate and make two, one with a regular A and one with an at sign. So these are just different techniques for brute forcing. It's not just try byte one, okay, increment by one, try byte two. Um, and by using these different methods intelligently, we can actually really, really, really efficiently hit 90, I want to say 90, the vast majority of common users' passwords. So with our salted MD5 example, on a 2012 MacBook Pro, I can do 33 million MD5s per second, which is a lot. Um, to do all possible six character passwords takes about five hours, which definitely it's a lot of time, but it's a lot less uh, time than you would think, um, but especially because it can do the entire English uh, language in about 1.8 seconds. It can, and that when I say the entire English language, I'm including all possible case permutations. So lowercase a n d, capital A, lowercase n d, and so on. Two seconds. Leet permutations, including all leet speak possible conversions on that dictionary, is about an hour. So passwords that we know as relatively insecure, the general public thinks is relatively secure, can be brute forced in less than a day, at most. But we can still do better as an attacker. Enter this beast. This is one server out of a cluster of five. There is a total of 25 GPUs in this system. It was built for about some, they didn't actually publish the numbers, but based on my calculations, it's somewhere underneath $50,000. It can do 180 billion MD5s per second. Now to put that in perspective, a 2012 MacBook Pro will cost you what, maybe $3,000? Maybe $4,000 if you go for the really, really super high end? For an order of magnitude more money, you get four orders of magnitude faster attacks. And the system that this is built in can actually be expanded up to 100 GPUs without further modification. So all these numbers we can theoretically multiply by some factor less than four and still have room to grow. It can do all six character passwords in four seconds. It can do seven character passwords in six minutes. I mean, these passwords, even eight characters, fall in about 10 hours. So an eight character random password that we would think as relatively secure falls almost instantly, or at least instantly in the, the context of an attacker. The entire English language, yeah, don't even think about it. Um, and lead speak permutations are under a second. So this is a very realistic and very dangerous and very scary style of an, of an attack. So I want to put in a, uh, a note about MD5. A lot of people will come out and say MD5 is broken, you shouldn't use MD5, blah, 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 blah. And they're half true. If you're, using, if you're doing cryptographic things with MD5, it is horribly broken and should be avoided left, right, and center. For password storage, MD5 is not technically broken. It's broken because we can attack it, but the breaks in MD5 um, don't apply for password storage. However, it is broken because no primitive hash algorithm is not broken. SHA-256 and SHA-512 are within an order of magnitude as broken and as easy to brute force as MD5. So the big takeaway I want, to go, I want you to take away from here is at absolute minimum, you cannot just use a primitive hash. 
You cannot just use SHA-512. You can't just use MD5. There are some methods that we can use to um, make these safer. So let's talk about them now. How can we combat such powerful machinery? Well, we can iterate. So if we take that slow primitive and we execute it a whole, whole lot of times, so in this example, a thousand times, all of a sudden we've made MD5 a thousand times slower. <coughs> From our servers, this will take less than, less than about 50 milliseconds. But to an attacker, that means that it's going to take him a thousand times longer to brute force our hash than it took us to generate, or than the raw MD5. So we're intentionally slowing it down. And this is a very, very important concept that'll keep coming back up. If we want to brute force this with that big behemoth cluster, we can do about 70 million of them a second. So it brings us back into the realm of raw MD5 on a MacBook Pro. The entire English language, though, is still ridiculously fast at under a second. But we can still do better. PBKDF2 kind of looks like, if you look at the internals of it, it looks relatively similar to how um, that iterated MD5 worked. But there's a couple of very important differences um, relating to specifically how it's built and how it does those iterations, which makes it even slower. And additionally, we're going to swap out MD5 in PDBKDF2 with SHA-512. This is very important. MD5 was designed to be implemented in hardware, which means when it was designed, it uses little bits of memory. So when you do an MD5 hash, I believe the internal state table is on the order of 32 bytes. No, 64 bytes. No, I'm sorry. The internal state table is 128 bit. So that means if I want to execute 1,000 of them in parallel, I need 1,000 times 128 bytes of memory. I'm sorry, bits of memory, which fits into a GPU really, really, really nicely. A GPU can execute lots of things in parallel, but its real constraint is the memory for each one of those things in parallel. So if we can make it use more memory, and if we can make it use bigger operations on, those memory, on that memory, it makes it less efficient on a GPU, and that's what we want. So SHA-512 is about as efficient on a CPU as SHA-256, but it's about an order of magnitude less efficient on a GPU than SHA-256, and that's going to work in our, into our advantage here. So when we plug this PBKDF2, we can do about 300,000 per second, which gives us a huge buffer on weak and moderate passwords. So a, six, a seven character password is seven years. That's pretty good. Um, an eight character password is 700 years. So if you're using PBKDF2 with current technology, you're basically safe with an eight character random password. Now if it's a dictionary password, then yeah, three minutes, forget about it. But we can actually do better. Enter bcrypt. Um, if you follow my blog, if you follow, um, there, there's a number of people now, the, the trend over the past about two to three years has been strongly moving in favor of bcrypt. Um, it, it's based on the Blowfish cipher, which I won't get into the details on how it's based, but basically they took the Blowfish cipher, removed a component of it, and made it a hashing algorithm. Um, it's the same execution time as PBKDF2, but it's much, much, much harder to run on a GPU. Remember how I said SHA-512 used bigger operations on bigger memory? So SHA-512 uses a 1024-bit internal state. This uses a 32-kilobit internal state. So it uses much, much more memory, and it does much harder things with it. So with the same execution time, we drop our 300,000 per second down to 70,000 per second, which basically makes a six-character password at four months relatively safe. A six-character password is nothing. You know, in, in terms of what we've been taught and what we're, we learn in the industry, and I mean we as developers, not necessarily security industry, six-character password is normally thought as very insecure. You know, if you try to set your Google password to a six-character password, they'll yell at you. But if you're using bcrypt, it's reasonably safe. You know, you're protecting your users better. 
an eight character password, three millennia. Now, we could develop uh, better attacks, um, and we do develop better attacks, but the point here is bcrypt um, is plenty slow for 99.9% .9 of use cases. So bcrypt takes a salt, a um, password, and a third parameter called cost. And basically that cost is how slow the algorithm is. Um, it's a minimum of four and a maximum of 31, and it's a power of two scale. So a cost of eight it runs in half the time as a cost of nine. And cost of 10 runs in twice the time of nine. So by increasing this cost, we can make um, ha password hashing less and less efficient, as inefficient as we can afford. So my rule of thumb that I recommend is between a quarter of a second and a half a second. It's long enough where your users aren't really going to notice and complain that logging in takes forever. I mean, they'll, they'll feel a little bit of sluggishness, but it's not bad noticeable. It's also not bad on your hardware, because with, a, with modern uh, server hardware, you can do about, I think it's on the order of 16 bcrypts simultaneously without bottlenecking the CPU. So with, if you consider how much authentication traffic you get, a quarter to a half a second turns out to be a good baseline for the vast majority of use cases. So as a result, um, 10 is a good baseline. If you can afford it, go higher. Um, 11 is good, 12 is even better. And if you have the latest, greatest, biggest box that you can afford, and it takes a tenth of a second to run at 12, bump it up to 13. The point is make it as hard as possible. And every time you get new hardware, make sure to rerun this check and up, um, increment it when you um, increment the cost for that new hardware. So extending bcrypt, I want to talk for a quick second about um, a new API that's in PHP 5.5, which is simplified password hashing. With bcrypt, we use the crypt API, and it's built into PHP core. However, it's a little bit wonky to work with. You need a fair bit of bootstrap code, and the, result, the way you build the salt's not really intuitive, and there's a lot of bugs in implementations, and I wrote a blog post on that on my blog um, that I definitely recommend you take a look at if you're going to implement something like this. Um, so the thin wrapper basically does the salt generation for you, validates everything, does all the error handling, allows you to specify salts, uh, I'm sorry, cost, and it's as simple as a single call, uh, single call. The options over here is an array, and it's an optional array. So it defaults to a cost of 10 if you don't specify it, but you can pass in in the options array cost equals 11 and increase that cost. And then to verify the password, single function call, password underscore verify. Now, since 5.5 isn't out yet, and the majority of people aren't here and in uh, the general community aren't going to adopt 5.5, at a production level for probably a little while, realistically, um, I released a compatibility layer on GitHub. Um, it, password underscore compat, it's installable via Composer. Laravel 4 is using it right now. Um, basically, it just simplifies um, using crypt in the user land. Um, oh. There was one more important thing I wanted to say. Oh, um, there's another function that's, that I didn't put on this slide. Password underscore needs underscore rehash. So let's say you want to increment the, um, the cost parameter in a production app. You can still verify that password because the old cost is stored inside the hash. And in fact, you know what, let me show you that real quick. So with raw bcrypt, this is about the code you need to simulate those two functions. So you create a salt, and I would recommend using a better random method than this. Um, you build up the, the string, and you pass it into crypt, and then you have to check the length of the string, and then you return the output of crypt. And then to verify, you just um, 
validate these. So if we go back to our SQL injection example, <coughs> this is the string, that the hash that's returned by crypt. The first, two did, the first three digits here are what's known as a, a um, algorithm specifier. So dollar sign two followed by either an A or a Y specifies bcrypt. Then we have the cost parameter 10. And then we have this long string. Well, this long string is actually two different strings. The first part of it is the salt, and the second part of it is the resulting hash. So because it follows the same format in the crypt, ver um, verifying it is really easy. So since the password hashing API um, is a thin layer over crypt, we can actually update the algorithm and the options for newly created hashes while still having the old hashes work. However, that poses a problem. When a user with an old hash logs in, their password is still the old password. We want to upgrade that. So with the um, needs underscore rehash function, you can pass in that old hash and the options that you're going to use for new hashes, and it'll give you a Boolean result of is this good or do you need to rehash and store the password again? So it allows you, it gives you an upgrade path. But here's the thing. We can do even better than just bcrypt. Let's encrypt it. But instead of encrypting the password, let's encrypt the hash. So we run through bcrypt, then we encrypt the result with AES-128, which is a secure standard cipher. There's a couple problems with this though. Um, it requires that you store um, cryptographic keys, cipher keys, in your application. A lot of people do that in a, um, a config file, but if you looked at, if you followed the news of GitHub in the past 48 hours, that is a horrific idea. Um, and just to tell, let you know what that was, GitHub launched code search yesterday morning. It was down as of yesterday night. And the reason they took it down was people were storing public keys secret keys, um, uh, cipher keys, and things like that in their applications. And now with code search, I can just type in where file equals something dot PEM or um, dot PUB, and I can get those keys. So people are actually storing their keys in GitHub, and code search allowed attackers to go out and figure out that, hey, you know what, here are their keys. So they pulled it down last night while they try to figure out how to do it. But I think someone, someone estimated on the order of 20,000 um, secret and private keys were leaked in that 24-hour period. So that's why when I say key storage is not trivial, most people don't believe me, it's not trivial. It's very, very easy to screw up. Um, so if you need to do this, you probably should have an expert on hand already with your, um, working with your security. And use this method only if you really need to. If you're only if your site is really high value, where those passwords are very, very important, bcrypt alone is sufficient for 99.9% .9 of use cases. But if you're in a bank where a password leak may theoretically mean millions of dollars, you may, be want, you may want to do something like this. Or if you're on a very high value target like Google, where the password that you use on Google is high value because you can use it for their wallet, you can use it for email, and once you get access to someone's email, you can get access to all their systems. So only use this on something that's high value. And I know it's weird to say um, that a system that you're building, even as a publicly funded and traded company, is not important. It's not. Not in the scale. Yes? Every system is important to a certain degree. Um, and that's why I'm saying absolutely use bcrypt at the minimum. bcrypt is safe enough. This just adds a little extra layer on top of additional defense. But in that additional defense, it adds additional complexity. And that complexity is non-trivial. So one of the, the primary focuses of cryptography and of security, simplicity is key. The more complex you make your code, the more complex logic you have, the better of a chance for a vulnerability is in somewhere. So that's why I'm not recommending encrypting to everybody. 
But if you need to, and it's a judgment call, and I'm not saying that only if you're Google do it, but only if you consider the site high value or the data high value. But yeah. So how can we, do, how can we attack this? Well, SQL injection is not enough because what we're getting back now is a string of garbledy gook bits. We can't do anything with that as an attacker. But what happens if someone was able to inject code? Uh, let me check out. So we have our SQL injection. And this is that same bcrypt string, but it's encrypted. So this means nothing to us. But if I'm able to get either code onto your server or code to execute by your server, uh, let me view source. So this is basically just the stub file that I use. And through the browser, because I was able to get code onto the server, I'm able to actually see that raw cipher key. And this is an example of how absolutely positively not to store keys. And this is why I'm saying key storage is non-trivial. Because a simple, what would have been a bad break, just turned into an epically bad break. But it's important to note that with this, since we're encrypting bcrypt, the po worst possible compromise that can happen to steal those hashes at worst is no worse than bcrypt by itself. Because you can't get back to the password without brute forcing that bcrypt hash. Make sense? So I want to talk a little bit about the future, both of storage and of attacking. Um, so that's where we are today. In the future, there's a new algorithm called Scrypt. Um, it was actually produced in 2007. And it's based on a new technique. So bcrypt uses 32 kilobytes of uh, memory and does a whole bunch of stuff on that. Scrypt is what's known as sequential memory hard, which means instead of using 32 kilobytes, let's use 32 megabytes. And let's use that 32 megabytes in such a way that you can't parallelize any of it. So you have to do block A, block B, block C, block D for the entire 32 megs and use that to generate the hash. So by using, and um, it's important to note here that on a typical server, the CPU is pretty efficient with memory, especially with big blocks of memory. But with a GPU, it's very inefficient with big blocks of memory. So the trade-off here intentionally makes it harder for a GPU. However, the reason why it's not used and the reason why the new API doesn't use it yet is it's incredibly new. Um, five years, it's six years old now, five and a half years old. In terms of cryptography, that's like an infant. Um, it needs a number of years, it needs more peer review, it needs more further study, and if it stands up to that kind of, a, of a scrutiny, then it'll eventually be made into a standard, get a crypt prefix, and then it'll be pulled into PHP. But until that time, it's not really ready for prime time. There's also um, something very interesting going on, and this was actually just came up on the mailing list, um, on the crypt dev, dev mailing list off of OpenWall um, in the past about two weeks. They're setting up an international hashing competition for password storage. So AES, which is an, a, a cipher, an encryption uh, scheme, is an sta international standard. There was a group that formed, they had a competition, they vetted, I think it was on the order of 64 different ciphers, and through a process of elimination of voting, they chose um, Rindell, which is what AES really is, just a different name for it, as AES. There's currently talk about um, setting up a competition to come up with new and better mechanisms for storing passwords. Scrypt is great, doesn't mean it can't be improved upon. So that's the goal here, is to have a community um, come up with a better solution rather than just individuals as it's been for the past while. The future of attacking. Um, just yesterday, a new study was, uh, came out, and I actually updated my slides this mor uh, yesterday morning to update this. Um, I believe it's Cornell, one of the major universities in the US, 
just did a paper about attacking grammar-based uh, passwords. So if your password is a sentence that is grammatically correct, they're actually able to brute force that with their algorithm. So I mean, think about that for a second. These algorithms are getting so much smarter and so much more efficient day by day that even though we may not be able to increase the number of hashes we try per second, we can make each try uh, have a higher probability of succeeding. Um, we can also do complex combinations of words. So this is something a little bit outside this talk, but XKCD did, the, did their comparison of a, I believe it was a 10 character password versus four word, random words that you put together. And their conclusion was four words are better than that, better than a 10 character password. Here's the problem with that. If I as an attacker know that that concept is prevalent, I'm gonna tweak my algorithms to look for this more. If I attack this, correct horse battery staple or four word English combination directly, I can do that about as efficiently as an eight character password. But if nobody knows the scheme and it's a non-obvious scheme, I can't attack it directly until I see it. So when you see blog posts saying, well, you know what, take your password, add a period and then add a number to it, or add a period and repeat the password. Don't follow that. It's, it's very good advice. And up until the point of publishing, it was true. It makes you stronger. <laughs> but the second it's published, forget about it. Um, personally, uh, let me, oh, my keychain's in there. Um, I use a YubiKey. And actually, I have one. So this actually made the news on Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, because Google um, is now using these internally and they're testing it with tight integration with Chrome. So this is a keychain fob. It's got a USB connector on one end and it's got this little metal dot on it. What this is, is this is a USB keyboard. When I plug it in, I press the dot and if I press it for less than three seconds, it acts um, like a random password generator except it's a predictable password. So it's called a one-time password, OTP. And it connects with YubiKeys servers and I can authenticate over that using OAuth, even though the password is different every single time it generates. If I press it for more than three seconds, I get my own custom password that I stored on this. So I, well, I shouldn't be saying this, but I will. Um, I generate a 62 bit, a 62 byte key. So really, really, really big key. I store it on this so I don't have to remember it. And whenever I want to log into something secure, I plug it in, I press the button, and boom, my password's filled in for me. Um, it does use the same password for every site. So you wouldn't want to use this for every site, but you can use this to strengthen other site passwords or to if you're going to do encryption or something like that. Um, hands up, who wants one of these? All right, I'm just going to throw. <laughs> and note, I did not tamper with it. Yes? Uh, it's probably a key that if somebody steals it, they actually, I mean, if I Absolutely. Account, I have your email, and I steal yep. it from you while you're in a cafeteria or something. So I'm there's, in, I can log yep, in. absolutely. So the point was, if, what if someone steals it? What if someone steals mine, they can log in as me? Well, with the one-time pad, that, with the one-time password generator, that's true except I can log into yubikey.com because I have a separate key and de de deactivate that, that particular device. Um, and for the other one, I don't use just that. I use that as either a prefix or a suffix, that much I'm not gonna tell you, to another strong password. So it takes a strong password and makes it stronger. Thank you very much.